This video is sponsored by Blackbird Interactive. Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at Crossfire Legion, an upcoming real-time strategy game that I've had my eye on for some time now, hearkening back to the classics. I often get asked where these kinds of strategy games have gone, so I'm really excited to be able to highlight this one for you today. I've had the chance to play a fair bit of it and get familiar with its systems, and for those of you looking for a good old-fashioned, fast-paced, action-packed, no-time-to-hesitate RTS with base building, build order considerations, resource management, and all that good stuff, this one's worth keeping an eye on, and you can learn more about it by checking out the link in the description and pinned comment down below. Or, of course, watching this video. The Setup The story behind Crossfire Legion is perhaps as intriguing as the story in Crossfire Legion. It gives you a good idea of where this game's coming from and where it might be going, so really quickly before we talk about the in-game storyline, I think it's worth knowing that Crossfire Legion is a strategy spin-off title based on the online FPS Crossfire that kicked off back in 2007, one of the most played video games in the world by player count. It's a huge multimedia franchise with a few spin-off titles developed by various developers, and Crossfire Legion is being developed by Blackbird Interactive. These are the folks that brought us Homeworld Deserts of Karak, and will be bringing us Homeworld 3 as well, experienced developers in the strategy gaming space since before the existence of Blackbird Interactive itself even, and they have a real knack for creating compelling narratives and gameplay systems, so I'm very excited to see where they take the world of Crossfire. Crossfire is the story of two competing ideologies, represented by two opposing factions battling for world domination, hoping to control the world's resources. Global Risk is a counter-terrorist private military corporation working outside the bounds of political affiliations to avoid bureaucratic inefficiencies. Their sworn enemy and primary opponent is the Blacklist, a secretive mercenary organization whose origins remain unknown. They stand to fight against the metaphorical big guy and the repression of the meek and powerless. They look to help smaller nations stand up against the threats of greater powers, helping people fight for their freedoms and rights. In Crossfire Legion, we're going to see the introduction of a third faction into the mix as well. For the first time, New Horizon will be joining this world, and very little is known about them. They're shrouded in mystery, they have their own ideology, and it is starting to make a mark. And it feels as though they've been waiting for this particular moment before diving into the fray. Apart from the multiplayer game modes, which are the primary focus of the game, there's a single-player campaign that'll tell the story over four acts as well, and though it's not playable in the current build of the game, I'm curious to see how the narrative is presented and how the game mechanics are adapted for the approach. I imagine we'll be learning about this new faction and seeing how the three interact and play across the campaign gameplay, but that's something we'll dive into later when I can get my hands on it. For now, Let's discuss what I have been able to check out, and there was a lot. Three customizable factions. So we already discussed the background of the three factions, Global Risk, Blacklist, and New Horizon, but let's now discuss how that translates to actual gameplay variances between them, particularly with the multiplayer custom loadout system. Each faction is able to customize their loadout before diving into a game, swapping alternate units in and out, and though not all options are available in this early build, the idea here is to make each faction asymmetrically balanced, but still potentially surprising to the enemy. You can choose between different commanders, each of whom provides different special abilities, and you can swap in a variety of units, from infantry to armor to air, each with their own designations, uses, and special abilities too. Some of these special abilities are innate to the unit, while others require you to research upgrades to acquire them during a game. Global Risk's available leader has two special abilities you can deploy anywhere on the map to either bolster the rate of fire of units while also healing them within a radius, or to launch a massive off-map artillery barrage at an area. These cost energy, which I'll explain further in a bit, but that means you'll not always have access to these options and will want to use them tactically when most appropriate. When it comes to the units themselves, the Global Risk approach is really about quantity and speed of production over quality or staying power. The infantry, especially, will die about as quickly as they're recruited, and the hope is to get as much damage out as possible before they perish and then get replaced. Combat boost can help them move faster and even increase their DPS, but at a cost of their health. 
The rocket troopers are ideally used against vehicles, and both infantry types can be upgraded at the barracks, allowing them to place turrets without the need of a worker. The three ground vehicles are a bit bulkier, ranging from the mine-laying scout vehicle, the Cavalier, to the unarmed support vehicle that can use EMP to fry enemy shields, energy, and cloaking, and can create a mobile shield bubble to reduce damage taken by units within said bubble. The Phalanx, meanwhile, is a decently powerful tank that can be upgraded to add a new ability, allowing it to hunker down, reducing how much damage it takes, but pinning it in place until deactivated. It cannot shoot at air targets, though, so you'll need to be very wary of that. Now, in the air, the Javelin provides good maneuverability and decent damage output, but is really meant for harassment. Even with the upgraded armor to make it sturdier, it'll get destroyed pretty quickly if you're not on top of it. Finally, the Morning Star is a deadly vehicle, especially against infantry hordes able to barrage an area or, with an upgrade, able to provide a target ally with a protective barrier. The vehicles and aircraft are Relatively speaking, flimsy too in comparison to other factions, but a combination of the three types of forces complemented by the rate at which you can churn out reinforcements means you can keep the pressure on with global risk. They're also able to build some of the more powerful turrets and anti-air SAM sites, and though these are of course stationary, they can be built in forward positions as well as on the high ground to great effect. Blacklist is a bit more unconventional in its approach, taking advantage of cloaking abilities, high-tech weaponry, and slightly more durable troops, but having slightly flimsier static defenses in the single guard tower type that shoots both at airborne and ground enemy targets, but lacks the heavy hits of the global risk turrets. Phoenix is the one commander available as of now, and his two special abilities involve establishing a remote outpost that provides healing within a radius, and using Ghost Recall to teleport troops to that outpost. The latter requires the units to remain stationary for some time as the teleportation activates, but can be used both offensively and defensively in a pinch to quickly move troops around the map. Again, these cost energy, so you need to be judicious in their use. The Bulldog is the low-tier infantry unit, a bit hardier than the Global Risk equivalent, and able to enter stealth using its camouflage special ability once upgraded. Stealth breaks when moving or shooting, but is an excellent tool for scouting or laying in wait to spring an ambush or to circumvent enemy units. Lions are heavy hitting, but they fire very slowly and it takes an upgrade to buff rate of fire by a short duration when used. The cheetah lives up to its name. It's extremely fast, armed with a machine gun to deal with infantry, and when upgraded, the harpoon can be used to immobilize vehicles and it'll even force aircraft to the ground allowing some of the deadlier units to shoot at them despite not typically being able to fire against airborne units. The Chameleon is a support vehicle, but it does include a weapon too. EMP bursts can be used to ensnare enemy targets, while liquefaction will make terrain harder to pass through, slowing units down as they walk through liquefied terrain. The Sonic Wave can be used against enemy ground targets, and it reduces damage output from the target when attacked, potentially nullifying a fairly potent force. The crocodile, meanwhile, can only fire at ground targets and can find itself in trouble when locked into its long attack cycle, but with the Scorch upgrade, it's able to apply a burning damage over time to its target, allowing it to switch targets while causing damage and potentially killing or destroying its initial target as well. A very powerful tool, this one, but it can't hit anything in the sky, so you'll need to keep an eye out. The Dragonfly is the first airborne unit and is overall pretty flimsy, but can be upgraded to cause extra damage to structures. The Falcon, meanwhile, is great against enemy vehicles, and with upgrades, it'll fire more rockets per volley to cause even more damage. New Horizon is, as you might expect, its own beast. The only of the three factions with shields on top of their health, New Horizon units are able to retreat after their shields are damaged, preventing any damage to their actual health, and then they can recharge their shields either using their own energy or energy from other buildings. This makes them very durable as long as you can stay in control of the situation, moving troops back if they have weakened shields or selecting the right troops to convert their energy back into shields at the right time. Their currently available commander, Angel, is able to create a null field that reduces damage taken by friendly units within an area, 
and is also able to create a radiation zone that causes damage over time within the radius of the effect. The Vampire is their primary infantry unit, a melee one with upgrades that help it recharge its shields with every attack and let it dash short distances to get in and out of combat very quickly. It can also transfer shields between units, so you can see how these guys can deal damage to regenerate their own shields and then spread that love around. The Lycan are a very interesting ranged infantry unit that can use its jump pack to traverse otherwise blocked terrain, opening up alternate angles of attack, keeping your enemy on their toes, and they can be upgraded so that their jumps will actually slow nearby enemies down when they land, and it'll also reduce the amount of damage they take shortly after landing, and this makes them an excellent and terrifying ambush force. They're also able to shield transfer, and so again, they can kind of spread the love around and keep other units alive for longer if needed. The Orion is a support vehicle able to heal and replenish unit shields, and it's also able to create a null void that pulls enemy units towards a location, and it can overcharge the weapon damage of a unit while reducing that unit's shields and health. The Cyclops is a very powerful anti-vehicle tool and the upgrade gives it a huge range bonus. It's best used against static enemies or clumps of enemies with its AoE effects. And the Titan is similar with its AoE damage output and it's able to charge into the enemy using its ground stomp ability when upgraded. It can recharge its own shield using energy and can cause a great deal of damage, though it's probably the slowest unit in the whole game. The Pegasus is an air unit that can switch between air-to-air -air and air-to-ground weapons on a whim, and the Typhon is a heavy-duty drone-launching mothership that can upgrade its shields and hit both ground and air targets. The defensive turrets of the New Horizon are nothing to write home about, really, but the shields on the units, the unique special abilities, and the firepower are all great ways in which these guys feel unlike their counterparts. As you can imagine, though, all of these differences are put to the test by the great equalizer that is the battlefield itself and the universal mechanics that all these factions need to contend with. Map Design and Tactics There are a lot of elements of classic design you're going to see in the maps and the demo has three fairly different experiences available across three distinct maps. A two-player map, a four-player map, and a six-player map. These maps are all designed to funnel the action one way or another, presenting choke points, points of interest, alternate paths, and good spaces to hide and prepare ambushes or forward operating bases. The workings of the economy will be familiar to fans of the genre. Your base will need to send units to mine minerals and fuel, where minerals are your most basic resource needed for the most basic troops and structures, and fuel is needed for researching upgrades and pursuing higher tier units and buildings. You'll eventually need to expand and Factions can only place new headquarters at specific locations across the map, near the mineral and fuel deposits. So you can't just put one down in a corner somewhere and hide it from your enemy and use that to stay alive and cheese the game. Good thinking. Resources can be depleted, so if a game goes on for long enough, that transition to your expansions will be very necessary. And though there's a pop cap of 200, you'll spend a lot of resources getting to that number and trying to stay at it. You're of course able to proxy build in other ways if you want to establish, let's say, turrets or even recruitment structures closer to the enemy, but every recruitment building needs to be individually upgraded to gain access to higher tier units, which is well worth keeping in mind. Tech upgrades and tier upgrades are done universally, but recruitment itself requires the recruiting building to be the right level. Some spots on the map will reveal a massive region if occupied, and other spots will provide health regeneration, great spots to retreat to, but as a result, potentially hotly contested and worth securing. Securing the high ground is always a good idea, and that holds true in Crossfire Legion 2. Units on the low ground cannot see units on the high ground, and as you might imagine, outside of a unit that can fire at the ground itself, most units cannot shoot without a specific target to fire on. Airborne units, and particularly tall ground units, can provide vision of the high ground, and that will allow everybody to fire from the low ground. But if that vision providing unit gets destroyed, the low ground is like the barrel, and your units, the metaphorical fish. Setting up ambushes, using stealth, harassing collectors are all fair game, and using things like jetpacks to circumvent barriers and 
ambush the enemy is always a fun time, it never gets old. Different maps will have different points of interest, and between single-player campaigns, skirmishes against the AI and other human players, and co-op playing with friends against the AI, I'm really interested in seeing how maps get developed around strategies and tactics and creating hot and cold zones, so I'll be very curious to see what other tricks remain up the developers' sleeves. With that said, what's next? The game is planning to release into early access around spring of this year, with a final release later this year in Q4. Before then, if you're curious to check it out, a demo will be available to play during Steam Next Fest right now between February 21st to the 28th. There's going to be another demo in April as well, so if you can't check it out during Next Fest, keep an eye out for it in April so you can see how the game plays and get a feel for it yourself. The developers are planning this early access approach because they're really looking for a ton of feedback to really hone the game in its final few months of development before that final release. So again, if you've got feedback, opinions, thoughts you want to share, the developers are all ears. So make sure you dive into the demos and the early access build as well so you can really help hone this experience. Don't hesitate as always to add the game to your wishlist if you want to stay on top of it. And again, you can find more information at the link in the description and pinned comment down below. I hope this video gives you some insight on Crossfire Legion and finally answers that call for the next classic RTS. If you have any questions or thoughts of your own, feel free to share them in the comments down below. I'd love to know what people think and I'll try and answer as many questions as I can. And if you've played the game in demo form or otherwise, feel free to share your thoughts down below too. For more strategy gaming reviews, previews, let's plays and more, don't hesitate to subscribe to the channel and as always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.